one of the first things we always ask is uh, what your name is, where you were born, and when you were born. William A. Hessen, Newark, Ohio. I was born in Newark, Ohio on September the 12th, 1916. And you just celebrated a birthday. I've just celebrated my uh, 90th birthday last Tuesday. Now there's one other thing. You uh, didn't quite get this the way you wanted to, but you had a special birthday plan, didn't you? You flew somewhere? Oh, we, well, uh, we went on a little trip. Uh, my wife and I went on a little trip. Uh, uh, my wife, Anita, still flies. I haven't flown for about three years. We, we, went, we tried to get down to uh, Arizona with 15 other planes in the Colorado Pilots Association, but uh, we couldn't make it much past uh, Farmington. They had a bad storm down the other end. So we stayed uh, um, three days in Farmington, had a nice time. Son Bill worked at the old radio station, little old tiny radio station in Aztec, New Mexico, so, uh, which is close to Farmington. So we went out there and looked around a little bit. We might mention that uh, Bill is the voice on the open and close of this program. Oh, wonderful. So everybody gets to hear your son. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Let's kind of go back. You, in Ohio, did you go to, to high school back there? Went to high school in Ohio, yes, at Newark, Ohio. And then uh, uh, had a year in Ohio State and uh, then a year at the University of Tulsa and then uh, the two years uh, at the University of Oklahoma. And between those years, I worked in the oil field in Ohio. Had to save up some money to get back to school. And I graduated in petroleum engineering in 1942. But uh, I graduated in January of 1942 with less than two months uh, from uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, by the time I, uh, uh, my, our graduation came along uh, in May of 42, I was in the service. What did you, did you, uh, were you drafted? Yeah, I was drafted. I tried to get in the Air Corps and also the Naval Reserve after getting out of uh, Oklahoma, but uh, I couldn't pass their color tests. But the Army wanted me real bad, so I was drafted. Your engineering background uh, came into play then? Uh, yes, yes. So what did they do with you when they got you in the Army? Did, did you go to OCS? Or? Yeah, I had my, uh, had my basic training in uh, Missouri, Camp Leonard Wood, and then I applied for uh, officer's training in uh, Fort Belvoir, that's engineers. Got through that, then I was assigned to the uh, 85th Engineer Heavy Ponton Battalion. Pontons are open boats, 20 feet long, six feet wide, open, rectangular in shape. And that's what we used with the 85th Engineer Heavy Ponton Battalion to cross rivers. It seems to me when we get together with the Remagen group that ponton and pontoon become uh, kind of a yeah. topic of discussion. You remember Al Nelson that uh, runs the Remagen Bridge Society he keeps kidding me. He wants to call them pontons or pontoons. He's great pontoon because he, got, he was shot. His outfit, 99th Division, got across the, uh, the uh, Remagen Bridge and then it was destroyed. But right after Al got across in the infantry, he, we, he was shot. He was wounded. So they brought him back over pontoon bridge on the Rhine River. He never let you forget. <laughs> no, no. So how soon did you go overseas uh, after you went through uh, your, your training? Let's see, that would be uh, early uh, 1944. And we, uh, we went overseas uh, on a big old pleasure boat of some kind. 
and we landed at uh, Casablanca, North Africa. Took a train from there to uh, Oran, North Africa. Picked up our equipment, our bridge equipment, and then trained at uh, um, Mustaganum, which is just east of Oran. And uh, that was uh, Patton's headquarters when the war was going on in North Africa. We, we trained there on the Pont de Chalif River. Train, train, train. That's about all we did up to this point. I was wondering what kind of, uh, especially in North Africa, you don't think of rivers and uh, water? Yeah, the Pont de Chalif was a pretty good sized river. And from there, we uh, convoyed to Bizerti. And uh, just a, we were just there for a, a few days. And we loaded on LSTs because of all of our equipment. We had 64 uh, truck semi-trailers and all kinds of smaller trucks. We had cranes. We had uh, assault boats, they call them, with power on them. Uh, all kinds of equipment. Uh, an engineer outfit to build bridges, that's a, that's, that was our job. We didn't shoot at anybody, they shot at us. But as we moved throughout North Africa and then uh, through Italy, or through, uh, well, Italy and then France and then Germany, we, when we would stop at night while convoying, we'd have to hide in woods or big buildings or something. And that's the way we went. Uh, from uh, Bizerti in LSTs, that's lending ship tanks, we went to uh, Italy, was there for a while, did some more training, no combat. And uh, a little aside here, uh, while we were there, uh, I had audience with the Pope, me and 200 other officers. I had, uh, I had uh, our uh, battalion uh, doctor, medic with us, he was Jewish. He ended up as a big surgeon in uh, Pittsburgh later on. But he was curious and I was curious being a, an Episcopalian. I was impressed with Pope Pius XII. Uh, tall, slim man with glasses. A uh, little thing, a uh, little uh, point with him. Uh, writers have given him a hard time about uh, not uh, uh, saving enough Jews in Rome. I don't understand how you can save Jews. He saved some. But how can you save anyone if the entire uh, uh, Catholic Church there uh, was uh, surrounded with, uh, with the German soldiers? Well, anyway, I, I, I was impressed with him. And from Italy, we went, uh, we went LST to southern France. We landed in southern France at Saint Tropez, uh, D plus nine. And we moved uh, inland uh, up to Lyon, France, and practiced uh, some more bridge work. And then from there, we went up to Looneyville, France and uh, put all of our equipment inside of old car barns. And we were there in the winter of uh, 44, 45. Uh, not much training there. We were real close to the uh, Battle of the Bulge and no action though. And then on uh, March the 25th, we moved up to the Rhine River uh, we, we stayed back with the heavy equipment and uh, the assault boats were taken up to the Rhine River and uh, helped the uh, uh, infantry get across at night. We lost one man. Very fortunate there. Uh, about that time, the uh, artillery was up there pretty close. And according to records, they fired uh, 10,000 rounds of something 
on the far shore of the Rhine River. And it helped us, of course. So uh, on the night of the 25th, we moved in up to the Rhine at Worms, Germany, and uh, built a heavy pont and bridge 1,000 feet long in nine hours. Uh, no interference. We had an umbrella of planes overhead for, for security. Uh, and we, got, we had infantry across on the far side at that time. We, we did uh, take a few prisoners, but uh, nothing rough. So we were real happy with all that. And uh, uh, the, the story is that uh, we were there with the 7th Army. I was with 7th Army all the way. Uh, the 3rd Army is right there with us. And uh, the story is that uh, uh, General Patton took his tanks across the river. That's as far as I think I'll go with that one. A little story about that. Well, we'd like to hear it. Uh, before Patton took his tanks across the river, uh, he went out on the river and relieved himself. That was his objective in the war, uh, we think. Well, that's the story I get. I was busy back there bringing all those trucks up. We, see, we only had 64 uh, truck, uh, boats, pontons. Uh, so we had to have many, many more. And it was, it was a big convoy there that we had to get up there and get organized. But uh, it worked out real well. And then from there, we went upstream and uh, built another bridge in about a week. And then from uh, after, we, we maintained those two bridges for about, uh, I believe, uh, six weeks. And then we went, we moved on to the, uh, the, uh, the next spot at uh, on a river. I'll probably think of it pretty soon. And build another bridge uh, north of uh, Munich. And uh, everything got along fine there, which is very close to the end of the war. And we moved on to uh, Austria and bivouacked there for a while. And they thought there was going to be, uh, it would be uh, 50,000 German troops down south into, in the uh, Andes. Well, I don't know what we could have done down there unless build another bridge, but uh, it turned out that it was a false alarm. And that's where we were. And we, uh, uh, after uh, armistice was signed, soon after that, oh, we picked up a, a little, uh, a 15-year-old handsome Italian boy in Italy he wandered in the camp there in Italy uh, one day and said he'd like to work for food. He said that his parents had been backed up to a, to a stone quarry there close to his house, which is northeast, uh, yeah, northeast of Apple, uh, Naples, and they had, the Germans had shot him. They must have objected, they were fighting something. But his grandparents lived, so we kept him. A mess sergeant put an, uh, some clothes on him, a uniform on him, and uh, he worked in the officer's mess from Italy through France into Germany. So one of my sergeants and I, who could speak, uh, he could speak uh, Italian, Italian. Uh, the thing about this Italian business is that we called them Itais when we were there. So I say Italian, my wife uh, corrects me all the time. Anyway, uh, a, a sergeant and I uh, brought him back over the uh, Andes and back to his home was it town. The Alps? Yeah. Was it the Alps? Uh, over the Alps. What did I say, Andes? Andes. Over the Alps <laughs> and uh, brought him back to his hometown. His grandfather was there and some of his relations. 
And they all got together and we had a nice meal. It wasn't fancy, but a nice meal. And the grandfather sat next to me and uh, husked uh, uh, big chestnuts for me and laid them out there. Nice people, good people. That's about the end of my uh, operation. Okay, we got some questions. Uh, while we're on this, did you ever, were you able to ever contact this young boy later on after the war? About uh, two years ago, my wife Anita and I were back in Italy and I, in, in Naples. And I told the man at the hotel, the, the desk clerk, about it and the story and what little town he was in. He called from there and called and finally got a hold of a cousin, I believe it was, and the cousin said that uh, Raphael had died the year before. And so he, he would have been in his 70s then, see? Going back to, so it was pretty close. Going back to, uh, you know, being on all these rivers and putting together bridges, how much resistance did you really run into in some of these bridges? Did the Germans fire at you on some of these? Uh, at, at Worms, as we were moving through the city of Worms to work, go up to the river, uh, they, were, they were hitting the city because they knew we were coming. And I remember as we dro drove through there at night, <coughs> big chunks of uh, stone were falling off of buildings around it, but it didn't hit us. That's about all, all, we, all of the resistance we had that I, that I know of. But uh, the, the artillery had taken care of things in pretty good shape on the far shore. We, we did catch some, uh, catch some, uh, some, some uh, prisoners and brought them back on our shore. And one of the officers who was, had been born in Germany would question them. And then we lost the one man on the assault crossing. Uh, ironically, his nickname was Chicken. Nice kid. Uh, I forget his name, but uh, a lot of uh, the boys in my outfit, soldiers in my outfit, were from New York. He was, uh, he was Polish. Nice kid. That's the way it goes. One of the big, biggest dangers, though, was was much from from the rivers and the swift currents, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, there again, uh, we know what happened down the, at the Remagen. Uh, we had all kinds of uh, well organized um, troops that were uh, they they had. They had uh, boats that they were cruising downstream as well as upstream. Uh, we had a net across the river to catch floating bombs and whatever. Uh, it, was, it was well organized, which I was thankful for that. Uh, and we remember we had the, the uh, umbrella of uh, planes overhead. I think Jimmy the actor. Stewart? Jimmy Stewart? Stewart. I think Jimmy Stewart was in on that. Uh, I'd, I'd heard that. Well, he flew over there, so. Yeah, he flew, yeah. People don't really understand. They, they hear about combat units, but they don't know how important engineering groups are in wartime. But no matter where you go, there are rivers. Right. Uh, they, uh, we were called combat engineers, but we didn't shoot at anybody because we didn't have time to do anything like that. Uh, combat engineers did a good job. Oh yeah, over there too. Uh, they're at the Ramagan Bridge. We had uh, we had a combat engineer outfit there, but all they did they manned the, they had machine guns manned along the near shore. That's about all I remember. So they, they had no trouble. Did you ever see the Ramagan Bridge? No, I've never been there. <laughs> but uh, those guys had a tough time. What, what's involved in building a bridge? How difficult is it? 
and what was your responsibilities and tell us about actually building these things oh what you had to do <clears throat> oh I, I was in charge of uh, all equipment i was a motor officer and uh, uh handled everything along that line i was not on the bridge but uh, uh, I, of course, helped build bridges when I was in officer's training and uh, in, in primary. But uh, no, I was not uh, involved in, in the building of. Those guys were good. They put the bridge together, the big 20-footers. Uh, they, they, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, the crane, a, a crane to pick the, the uh, boats Pontons off, off the trucks. They were upside down there, so they had to turn them over and set them out in the water. And they put about four of those together and made a, made a raft out of it. They had the big uh, four by sixes, bulk, bulk they called it. And they would put those across all the all the all the pontons and then uh, clamp, clamp them to the, to the boats and float them out there and then put them back in, put them in place for the bridge. And uh, then they had, they had chests, they call it. That was the flooring. Uh, they would put the flooring down, clamp that on. And they put it all together in nine hours, a thousand feet long. Uh, those boys were good. They had had enough practice. Let's put that. Uh, we had we practiced uh, uh, building bridges in uh, in the states in Oklahoma, where I was based, and on maneuvers in Louisiana, and then North Africa, some in in Italy, and uh, France, and and Germany. All that time. So they were ready. How much, you're talking about bridges that are going to take trucks and tanks and things. How heavy were the pontons? How big were they? Pontons? Yes. Uh, I don't know how, what weight they were, but they were 20 feet long and about six feet wide, and rectangular in shape. So then they could lay enough down to really carry heavy equipment. Yeah, well, the, see, the big boats had uh, great flotation, flotation. No, no problem with a 40-ton tank and heavy trucks and everything. And we, we uh, during the first month, uh, I don't know how many thousand vehicles we passed over that bridge with no problem. How many uh, men were in a unit that built these bridges? Uh, about 450 in the battalion. Now, the 85th was recognized pretty much uh, by the 7th Army, weren't they, as, as being outstanding in the work yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. General Patch, we got, a, we got a letter of recommendation. I've got a copy of it. <laughs> My medals amounted to uh, four, uh, four, four, four wars. I was going to ask you just a, a brief question. When you went into the Army engineers there, uh, did you understand how far back the engineers went building bridges for the Army? The I've heard the history, but uh, I guess pontoons were first. I don't, I don't think uh, they used boats at any time early, early. It's just something that... Uh, this war, though, was the first time in history that troops had to, to build bridges this heavy for this kind of uh, mm -hmm. equipment. I believe it was, yes. So prior to that, there were a lot of horses mm -hmm. and things of that sort pulling you know, yeah. artillery. That when, when the tanks and the heavy trucks went over, they were to keep a certain interval, not get, not get together. I, let's see, I think it was about 200 feet interval because the bridge would be like a, a ribbon on, in the water. Turn 
think of the name of that bridge up in Seattle up that goes across. The yeah, bridge. yeah. The same kind of motion then. Mm-hmm. My gosh. Except that one wasn't on the water. No, it was above. <laughs> it wasn't meant to be that way. Yeah. Um, so, uh, after you built the bridges, did the Germans ever fire on them and you have to go back and oh, make repairs? Uh, no, not on ours. Not on ours. By that time, Patton and the rest of them had them pretty well far away. No. Did Not, the engineer units, uh, did they do other things other than build bridges while you were traveling or when you were not? Oh yeah, engineers built uh, even permanent bridges, you know, a lot. They did a lot of that in uh, the Pacific. Not so much in, the, in Europe. Engineers, uh, well, engineers built the uh, airstrips, uh, air uh, buildings, of course, and uh, a lot of things. What other kind of things did your unit build, or were you just in, involved with bridges? Just bridges, yeah, just bridges. Bill, do you remember where you were on VE Day? And do you have any? Yes. Tell us about that. And do you have any reflections on the contributions you and your mates made towards the war? VE Day, I was on that Vorms Bridge, maintaining the bridge. Uh, not a lot of celebration or anything. We found a, yeah, we found a, a cellar full of wine on the near shore, so that helped. Good way to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, so. that was about it. Do you uh, go to reunions with uh, other guys from the 85th? Have you gone to reunions? Uh, yeah, we, we had, the uh, officers had a reunion or two in uh, Chicago, but uh, none for a long time. They're about all gone. I know of one that's left. Where's he? A bunch of old fellows. <laughs> Bill, are you glad that you had the opportunity to serve? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, when I was reading uh, uh, the funnies on the living room floor of our fraternity, at the University of Oklahoma on that Sunday morning when we heard about it. Uh, I belonged to a fraternity, but uh, to save money, I worked in the kitchen so that my room and board was, was, uh, was reduced from $60 to $30 a month. But uh, yeah, right, uh, my, my, uh, it seemed like everybody in school, seniors, uh, Wanted to get in the army, wanted to do something. And one of my fraternity brothers had left a school about uh, nine months before that. He uh, got his pilot's license in the service, and he was in, he was in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, and he was one of the two pilots that got off the ground at, uh, during that attack. Kenny, Kenny Taylor, he ended up as a, a general, retired. He lives in Alaska. When you, excuse me, when you went into the service, because you had been in college and had been involved with engineering, did they immediately put you in engineers? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had my record, of course. And there was no question about sending me to uh, engineer school at uh, Fort Belvoir. Do you have any idea how many engineering units there were in the Army, throughout the Army? No, I, I don't. I don't know how many engineering units there were. Quite a few, I was, <laughs> a bunch, both, both ways, uh, Europe and the Pacific. It was really important because going across Europe, it was just a series of rivers, wasn't it, all the way across? Yeah, yeah, quite a few, yeah. 
Italy had some. Uh, the uh, Seine in, uh, in uh, France, we practiced on there, on that. And uh, it was quite, quite a deal. It was. After this, you know, how, how do you, you know, you're re, you know, recognized as the greatest generation. What do you think about what's going on in the world today uh, with the Iraqi war and what's happening? I'm, I'm very unhappy about the, what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. I don't think, uh, well, we've got a big problem with, with what the problem is over there, of course. It's going to be a long time before it's over. I, I, I won't, I, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about what they're doing over there to criticize, but uh, things aren't going well anyway. I was going to ask you if you knew about anything about engineers that are in Iraq or in Afghanistan right now. No, I don't know. Uh, too much of what's going on over there, but the engineers are busy over there building, improving, getting water systems back to work, sewage along that line. I don't think there's too much uh, combat engineering going on. I, 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 don't, I don't read about it anyway. But yes, the engineers, I, I think, are doing a lot of good over there. Describe what the Remagen Society is. Describe what the Remagen Society is. Oh, let's <laughs> see. Organized by uh, private first class Al Nelson, a good friend of mine, a geologist I've known for years in the oil business. And you know the story on Al. I think he started this in the early 80s, I've been with them about 10 years, early 80s, they had meetings all over the place, and he, it was his idea, and he wanted to bring fellows in that had something to do uh, relative to the Remagen Bridge Society, or the ridge, bridge crossing, or the river crossing. So. Uh, uh, that's about all I know as to how it was organized, but Al had a lot to do with it, and he's been handling it ever since and doing a very good job. We're, we're, our, our numbers are declining, though. <laughs> Still a pretty good-sized group. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, quite a bunch of, nice bunch of fellows. I'm kind of describe, you know, what, what they do as a society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of explain to us, what happens at the Remagen uh, Bridge Society meetings, your, your reunions? Uh, what happens there? What happens? At, at the reunion. Describe it for yeah. the show, because we know, but the people who are watching don't understand what this is about. Yeah, he's saying that, you know, we understand about the Remagen Society, but people watching the show don't know what this is all about, really. What you do when you have your reunions. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're all called together by the same Al Nelson. He writes us little invitations, and on his invitation, he has a list of guys that belong to the, to the organization. And he has it once a year, in the springtime, for lunch. It's now being held out to, at the, yeah, where, where you, uh, it's now being held out at a, a golf course out in the east, Denver, about uh, 30 come, and uh, we have a nice lunch. They, they do a pretty good job on the lunch out there. And uh, when lunch is over, uh, we, uh, Al has each one get up and tell their story. Now, some of them aren't even from the, uh, related to the Remagen Bridge. Uh, there's one guy that uh, was a flyer in the Pacific. Can't get rid of him. Uh, there was a guy that uh, 
flew, uh, flew uh, some kind of observation planes in the Pacific. Uh, but uh, on the whole, uh, they're usually hooked up with the Rhine River some way or other. And uh, they have their stories. Some of them are pretty, pretty brutal. Al Nelson's story, when he got shot and so forth, he really opened up. Uh, I was at the uh, Re Regis. That's the first time I'd heard him open up like that. But uh, the, it, it, the, uh, the men that come seem to want to come every time they can, if they're able. And I think it's good for everybody just to pal around and talk a little bit and tell their story. Have you talked much about your uh, World War II experience over the years yourself to family or friends? Uh, only family. Uh, not, not too many of oh, them and friends. And the, uh, the, the Remagen Bridge Society talks and uh, and the Regis, uh, about the first time I've opened up, really. Uh, I was just happy, I'm happy, uh, pleased. They only lost one man. If they had spotted us convoying on the road, look out. Or knew where we were when we were bivouacked in our woods or someplace. So the German planes would be looking for you guys coming up with the equipment, wouldn't they? So that's why you had to hide everything out. The German planes would be looking for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we would be bivouacked in a, a woods, uh, mainly in, uh, like in, in France, every night after dark, uh, a light plane, German plane, would come over. And we used to call him Bedtime Charlie. He just floated around, floated around, kept looking. He was looking for us, I think. <coughs> one officer spooked one night and got to running through the bivouac area and ran into a clothesline. <laughs> Little things like that. I bet he knew he had it, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you guys uh, learn a lot about camouflage to try to protect against that? Oh, yeah, uh, quite a bit. Quite a bit of camouflage study and practice, but uh, we had none, none, of course, when we were moving on the road. We had some if we couldn't get everybody under cover, but not, not, a, not a big practice, no. But you were far enough behind the troops that the, the Germans weren't coming in and yeah. attacking. Yeah, yeah. We, we were... Uh, at times, uh, when we would be bivouacked there in, uh, in France, uh, the Air Corps would be there, and those guys would take off at 5 o'clock in the morning, made a lot of racket. My wife and I were uh, back at, uh, in uh, Kansas to Amelia Earhart's hometown, and we had, had a celebration there. Uh, one of my, my wife is a pilot, and one of her friends a pilot was getting an, an or thank you. You're welcome. Thank, getting an, is this, this straight water? Yeah, <laughs> a little vodka in it. <laughs> At uh, Atchison, Kansas, and her, her hometown. And uh, they, had, they had a lot of people there uh, that were getting honors for some, some flying tribute and one of the one of the uh, re recipients was a general four star general he was chief of the joint he was head of the joint chief of staff before the president one forget his name big old tall guy and uh, he got a he got a he got a, a, a plaque and so forth. So I went up and introduced myself to him later on at the dinner. And I told him about the, the, uh, the patent story and, and what, the outfit I was in and all that. He said, yeah, I, 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 I've heard about that. 
He just had a big smile on his face. A lot of people remember that one. <laughs> okay. You got anything else? Or? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm going to have something about a, five minutes after we shut down here. Yeah, John, if you want to escape now, but Yeah. Continue to take my right. Okay. Bill, lovely meeting you. Barry, do you oh, have anything? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank I'm going to run along. John, okay. Yeah, I was like interested so when you were in college, you, you were hashing. You were waiting on tables and so on to get through. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> Only I got free room and board. Oh, hey, she, oh, I see what you're talking about. <laughs> where, where did you go to school, John? I'm not really certain. Where did you go to school, John? Where did you, you, you go to school? Oh, University of Denver. Oh, wow. High price school. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder you were hashing. Well, I mean, it was on the GI Bill. It didn't cost me anything. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Nice to see you. Guys. Nice to see you. One other question, because you talked about um, when you were convoying through Italy or France after you'd moved across, did you guys move very quickly with all your equipment, or how fast could you move with your huge... Hold up, we're going to wait for a second. He's yeah, about as fast as those trucks... Pull up the as fast as those trucks would go... Just a second, just a second. We're, we need to close the door for sound. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we, 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 when we would convoy in Africa and Europe, we would go as fast as the roads allowed. Try to get, a, get to our destination as fast as we could because we had no idea who knew where we were. Were the roads very good or did the roads have a lot of damage from combat? The roads, the roads in uh, even Africa uh, were not too bad. And... Uh, Roads in Italy and roads in uh, France were in pretty good shape. Some of those in, uh, in Germany were pretty well busted up. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm trying to think. I think we pretty much. Eric, Eric's going to have to edit all this, huh? Yep, that's, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't have any trouble with that. He just sits down and. Oh. Yep. Goes right after it. Okay. Okay. I think we're set. Oh, all set?